Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, if it's OK with everyone, we're going to start the webinar. Um, so welcome, and we know you're all very busy, so we won't take up too much of your time this afternoon. Um, just to let you know, this session is being recorded, and we will share the presentation with you afterwards, the recording of it, as well as some supporting resources. Um, so today you will hear from Capita. Um, represented by myself, um, also from um, represented from DFE, um, and we're joined also with Elaine McEwan from the South Eastern Regional College to give you some background into the kind of local benefits um, and what one of our local organisations have participated in as part of the Turing scheme. Um, we're also going to use through some case study examples, um, one particularly from a school in Glasgow who participated in, in Turing. Um, any questions you have today, please put in the chat. We will um, answer what if we can in the chat, and if not afterwards, we'll take your questions, find the answers, and come back to you on those. Um, so, as I said today, we are joined by um, Daniel Brooks from the Department of Education, the Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Team who lead on the Turing Scheme. Um, Elaine McEwan is with us, which is the Senior International Development Manager from CERC. Um, and then also myself, with, who I'm the marketing lead for our programmes and contracts at Capita. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, we'll just take you through a little bit more today. So obviously we're going to have an introduction from DFE about the Turing Scheme. Um, a little bit about the funding opportunities for Northern Ireland schools. Um, information on both Bella Houston and Southeastern Regional College. Um, some more information on how, how to apply and obviously opportunity for questions and answers as we go through. And then if we can answer at the end, we will. So if we move on to the next slide, I will pass you over to Daniel to do a quick introduction on the Turing Scheme. Thanks, Kira. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming today. My name is Daniel Brooks. I work for the uh, uh, UK Government Department for Education on the Turing Scheme in the uh, Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Team. I uh, just want to start off by thanking, uh, thanking you for taking the time to attend today's webinar. I just want to speak briefly now to provide a bit of the policy context for you as we start on the third year of the Turing Scheme, which will support placements that take place in the 2023 to 2024 uh, academic year. So some of you might have uh, experience of the scheme from previous years, and for others might be your first time in planning an application. But in either case, we're hoping that today's seminar gives you a better understanding of how the scheme operates as opportunity, opportunity to share stories from other providers who've been using funding, help you develop, help you develop the best possible applications so that your pupils can take advantage of the opportunities that the scheme offers. So in terms of differences between uh, the first, second and, uh, and third year of the scheme, there's no major changes uh, to the scope or operation of the Turing scheme this year. We have clarified some of the eligibility criteria to ensure that the program guide is uh, as clear as possible. We've got a list of changes that can be found on page seven of the program guide on our website. But like my key, my like the 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 main the main course that I want to get across to everyone today is that to ask everyone to to please do take advantage of the opportunities offered by the Turing scheme and the support offered by Capita as you prepare uh, to submit your applications and define your projects. Uh, you have uh, hopefully they'll have you'll find everything you need to prepare your applications uh, available to you now through the program guide and application guide uh, on our website. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing your projects develop and uh, get delivered. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the funding opportunities available for our schools. Um, in terms of Capita and our role in Turin, um, we were appointed by DFE um, in 2020 to promote and administer the scheme. And obviously we have a long term relationship with schools in Northern Ireland for the e and I, and we would love to see you applying um, and being successful in that funding. And today we just want to give you a little bit more insight on what is actually available as part of that funding. So to begin with, every school in Northern Ireland is eligible to apply for funding, and that's from primary school right through to secondary level. We have seen successes with the FE colleges and the universities applying for Turing Scheme funding, and we would really love to see that replicated in our schools. Um, there's two types of placements available. The short, short term placements. So that's anything from three days to two months. Um, 
and it has to be mostly classroom based. So these type of placements, they really do expose young people to new cultures, new learning experiences and also teaching staff to see how um, teachers teach in, in all their deliver lessons in other countries as well. Um, it can help everything from children's confidence to language barriers to, you know, give an opportunity to those students who have possibly never travelled before outside of Northern Ireland to go so. We also have what we call the, the benefit of living in Northern Ireland to travel to the Republic of Ireland um, because the Turing Scheme is open to travelling outside of the UK. If you have already established relationships with schools in the Republic of Ireland, it's a really quick step to apply for Turing Scheme funding or you can be really advantageous and travel anywhere in the world, of which we've seen lots of case studies from. So we have like a primary school who have taken students to India. We have schools that have taken um, pupils to Morocco for two weeks. Um, and then we've other ones that have went even further as Japan. So it's a real range of um, mobilities and placements that you can take part in. There's also the options for schools, particularly secondary schools here with participants 14 years or older to go on those longer term placements, which is anything from two, two to six months. So again, that would be staying with a host family. Um, it would be again anywhere in the world. It would be um, sp spending time in an educational setting, but also experiencing more of that culture in a longer term basement. Um, placement, sorry, and funding is available for what we call a chaperone or um, a safeguarding representative there to be with. The, the pupils as well. Um, there then is the next element of additional support. So part of the Turing Scheme's core um, objectives is to wind participation and make these opportunities available from students from any background, whether that's um, defined as being from disadvantage or with SEND or additional needs. Because of that, there is additional funding available. Um, and it's something if you are considering applying to make that clear in your application form. Um, and your submission that if your students are from either of those backgrounds, to, just to list that out, be very specific about that. That's where there's additional funding available for things like passports and, and visas and with, with send applicants to help with their, their care. So there's also funding for, for pre-visits to you know see, see if the place is suitable, etc. So there is all that extra funding available there as well for those participants. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we've got a little bit more information just on that. The programme guide will lay this all out and the funding streams in more detail, but just at a high level, um, the funding does, the co does cover pupils and accompanying staff. So if you can see um, there on that table, there's £53 per day for the first 14 days and £37 per day for the 15th day. That funding goes towards direct cost of travel, um, cost of living, etc. for placement. Um, for those defined from disadvantaged backgrounds, you receive more additional costs or actual more for travel expenses, as we said, health insurance, passports, visas, etc. And for participants from a SEND background or SEND um, needs, this will fund up to 100% of costs directly related to their additional needs. Um, and again, the programme guide will go through every single detail around that and really is your best go to guide to find out a little bit more about that and calculate what you may you may gain as part of the funding for your application. Um, and if we move on to the next slide. I just wanted to give some more information of why schools should actually apply. So obviously we're in the third year of the training scheme. We've seen some amazing um, benefits of pupils from schools participating in the scheme. Um, and you'll hear from some of those via our case studies. Again, we'd love to see more from, from Northern Ireland schools. Um, to be clear, it's not defined to language or specific subjects. It is cross-curricular. Um, so we've seen um, you know, placements going on, on sports placements and, and participate in tournaments. We've seen schools that are studying Japanese, go to a conference in Japan. Um, and then we've seen students just, you know, from you'll find out for Bell Houston traveling to Iceland as part of um, a project around environmental impact. But really, it can also fund existing school trips. So if you are considering an educational um, trip anywhere in the world, the train scheme is ideal to help fund that, um, particularly at the moment with the cost of living and pressures on school budgets as well as on parents. Um, it's also really, really beneficial for teaching staff. You know, they get exposed to new practices, um, 
teaching practices anywhere in the world and they can bring that back and adapt it into the classroom. Also what innovation has been used for pupils, it, it's amazing for them to experience the new cultures. I say there's many pupils, I'm sure many of your schools have possibly not travelled outside of Northern Ireland um, and really expanding their world and their view um, really help with their confidence and their, their future learning. Um, it does give pupils a, a more focused and deeper understanding of topics. So if that's a particular topic within history or geography um, or particularly a language, and it does build up your relationships internationally. So we, we will address that later in the presentation around an international partner or host organisation, and it is key to your application. But that could be a, a school you already have established links through, but there are also other ways which we will touch base on, on how to, to build those relationships. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, um, we obviously want to take you through a little bit of um, Bell Houston Academy's fantastic story. Unfortunately, a representative from Bell Houston couldn't make it today. Um, so we're going to give you some details about their um, their trip. Um, we do have a full recording for Bell Houston, which we will share afterwards to give you some time to absorb that information and also see the, the passion and, and the real benefits from those who attend it. So Bell Houston Academy is based in Glasgow. Um, as part of the sharing scheme, they were awarded £21,000. So this gives you a, a kind of scale of the funding that is available. Um, they, they participated in a trip to Iceland in May 2022. Um, and they took 14 um, pupils from inner Sydney, Glasgow. Actually, we have, I've just seen in the chat, we have someone from Bell Houston. Uh, Murdo, if you want to take over, I'm more than happy for that too. You do? No, uh, thank you very uh, much. No, it's all right. No, no problem. My colleague Janice, who uh, helped me put the bid together and stuff, she she can't make it today, but but I can. Yeah, okay. We, Thank you. We don't, I'll pass we it with you. <laughs> um, so what it was was um, COP twenty six happened here, if you remember, during COVID times, and around that time, I had heard about the Turing scheme, and what excited me mostly was the fact that there was so much support available uh, for some of our disadvantaged pupils. So in our school, we have over 40% free school meals and 64% of our kids are from uh, BAME backgrounds. And the fact that Turing allowed and helped us to make the trip free for all was very important. I think very often school trips, even just advertising a school trip can make those children who don't have much money in their family, make them feel very bad uh, and quite depressed actually, the idea of a school um, not being free at the point of delivery. So uh, what Turing did was enabled me to offer a chance, an opportunity, a life-changing um, experience to any child in our first and second year classes, which was 12, 13. And it paid for things such as passport photographs, uh, passports, uh, luggage that some of the children didn't have. It allowed some of them to get out of not just Scotland, but Glasgow for the first time in their lives. Uh, we had a link with a school just outside Reykjavik called Helga Felskoli, and uh, we spent a week there. The children spent time in the school. Um, there were very many difficulties in this, partly because of COVID. Um, the reason we chose Iceland was at the time there weren't that many regulations in, in Iceland around COVID, and thankfully that stopped. Um, the John Muir Award programme allowed us to work on something tangible with the Icelandic pupils and the Scottish students, um, which meant that they all worked together and had an outcome. Um, I would totally recommend the Turing scheme to any school in the United Kingdom. I think that any school trip, especially one abroad, there is really no need for any of these trips to be something that denies a life-changing opportunity to the poor. So I think the Turing scheme is a huge opportunity for teachers and schools. And I would get your applications in as soon as you can. Um, it, I think what, what you can do, the fact that I took 14 pupils, disadvantaged pupils from inner city uh, Glasgow on such an experience is something I will never forget. And I think it's something that all schools can gain from and all pupils will gain from. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marlo. That's really, really great insight. And um, get any questions that anyone has for Marlo, please put in the chat and we can address at the end, if that's okay. But um, great to hear, hear your story. 
Uh, we now are going to pass over to Elaine Keown from South Eastern Regional College um, to give you some of the insight from um, some of her local pupils who have participated in the Turing Scheme. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, thanks very much, Kira. Hello, everybody, um, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think for, from my, I was asked to kind of give you an indication of um, why you should apply from, I suppose, maybe a more practical perspective. Um, CERC has been running Erasmus projects uh, for the last 10 years. Um, so we're heavily involved in student mobility. And I personally have been managing these for the last six years. So whenever the Turing scheme was launched, we did put in uh, a bid and were successful in the past two years. Unfortunately, in the first year, COVID took over and we couldn't do what we wanted to do. But we did manage to get students away to the States last year. Uh, our professional cookery students went to Nashville and see a photograph there. So we're delighted um, that we have this replacement programme and I would definitely encourage you all to do. So I'm going to talk to you a wee bit more about the process. So you can have the next. Thank you. So um, as Kira said, please read the programme guide. It's really, really important, particularly when it comes to uh, the grant rates um, and your the, the travel grant will relate directly to your destination. So please read the programme guide, look at the eligibility criteria and in particular focus on the application criteria, which I'll talk about in a moment. Make sure you register for the programme. <clears throat> and I would also recommend that you have a dedicated administrative resource if you possibly can, simply because there is monthly reporting um, and it is now OK where we have 12 different curriculum areas going to various places around the world. So it's they're much bigger projects, but the same principle applies. And um, if you have one person who's dedicated to managing the paperwork, well, then it just makes the process so much easier for everybody. Now, I'm not saying it needs to be a full time resource, absolutely not. But um, it does take one person to really take hold of the project and manage that project from start to finish, from application right through to logistics and to the final report. And Kira alluded again to your partner selection, really important that you have a good partner, a good partner that is willing uh, and able to work with you and um, provide suitable accommodation options, bearing in mind all your safeguarding, GDPR regulations, etc. That it fits with your curriculum. So you have an idea of what students you want to go um, maybe what they want to do. Maybe you don't have an idea what, what you want them to do, but it must fit. Whatever you just do decide to do must fit with your curriculum and what. Uh, you might even find that some of it will help towards their examinations of um, think about learning outcomes. So what do you want them to achieve? Really important in these applications is the impact whenever you go to do your final report. Um, looking at evaluating what they've done, what's the distance travelled, what skills have they improved, what things have they learned, how do you know you've, they've done that and what impact is that potentially going to have on them. Um, and obviously you need to factor in some fun cultural activities where they learn a wee bit about the culture, about the language and like yourselves, 38% of our students last year didn't have a passport. So 38% of the students that went to mobility last year had never been outside Northern Ireland. Many of them had never been outside their hometown, which in some instances was Downpatrick or Bangor. So I can understand exactly what our, our previous speaker, uh, speaker has said. It is a phenomenal, fully funded opportunity to get students an experience that they perhaps uh, probably never would have. Um, I would also, also recommend that you sign either a memorandum of understanding or a letter of intent, and that just lays down everybody's responsibilities. So um, what's the responsibilities for you as a sending organisation? What are the responsibilities for your partner organisation? Um, so that everybody's absolutely crystal clear, because again, in my experience, even right now, we have students going to the States on Saturday and things are starting to come to light that we maybe, uh, weren't prepared for. So you need to be prepared for the unexpected, uh, but make sure those little things don't fall through the cracks. So the next slide then. Um, these are your four categories whenever you're writing the application. And um, I found uh, our first year, some of them were... Um, maybe a little difficult to understand what was actually being asked for. 
Uh, so I just thought it would be useful to give you an indication of what I put into the applications. So Global Britain is really about that international dimension. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing fits with the, the government's education strategy, local um, international strategies and your school development plan and your CAG. So you want to make sure that there is like a 360 degree view um, from a government perspective right down to your local school perspective. Um, and think about the employability. So what are the skills these children or are, are, are students are going to learn? How is that going to impact them in the future? Will it have a, an impact on their career? Probably. Uh, and certainly from feedback we have had, um, some of our students have gone on to really great things, not only because of this, but it has certainly helped. Are you developing a brand new partnership? Or are you building on an existing partnership? Are there reciprocal activities going on? Perhaps you've got a virtual mobility going on at the moment. Um, we have a virtual mobility with our travel and tourism students with a college in Japan. And that has been running as we're actually into the second year of that. And um, we're hoping to send students next year. Uh, so how does that all fit in with your school development plan? How does it fit in with perhaps, I know careers, it's, it's early, but still for, for, for uh, primary schools, you still need to be thinking about those, those skills. Um, and as I said, the roles and responsibilities uh, within your, your memorandum of understanding or letter of intent. Um, again, <clears throat> so moving on then to levelling up. Levelling up um, is one of your, your biggest sections and is about the widening uh, access piece. So again, like yourselves, we have about almost 30% of our students would fall into uh, the uh, disadvantaged groups. There's, there's various categories. Um, so you must demonstrate that you have a really robust recruitment and selection process. You must demonstrate that it's fair, it's transparent, it's clear, and the opportunity is available to everyone that is eligible. OK, so it doesn't have to be available to everyone, but everyone who is eligible to apply. So we would do class presentations. We ask students to submit applications. And then we have um, a fixed criteria interview process. So it would be myself as an independent, plus the, the lead tutor who is going with the students, who will who will undertake those interviews, score the students, and the top whatever number of places we have, where it's 10, 12, 20, uh, will be offered a place. Look at your, your SEN statistics, your free school needs, your disadvantage. Look at your catchment area. Do you, are you in an area of high deprivation? Um, and that is all going to be look at put in statistics. You know, you will all have loads and loads of stats for uh, your uh, your inspections, etc. So use those to your advantage in your application. And there should be a clear link between a positive impact and your value for money. So why are we do this? How is this going to be value for money? What's it going to impact and what? How is that going to impact? The next slide. So the next big section is your positive impact and your value for money. So your objectives linked to your strategies. What are your learning outcomes? What's the impact? What, ex what do you expect to this um, mobility? What do you expect the impact to be on the students, on the school, on the wider, uh, maybe your economic area um, and the wider community? So what are the potential outcomes in the longer term um, in terms of positive impact? Look at your quality assurance framework. Make sure you have a robust way of quality assuring um, your audit, your auditing processes, um, and that you've got you, know, you will all have set processes and policies and things, ways of doing that. Just use that. If you've got a framework, use it. How are you going to monitor them? How are you going to evaluate their learning? And what is the impact going to be? Look at the skills agenda. So if you're thinking about an area. What are the skills? What's the skills agenda? What are the skills gaps? And how can you fit in with that? Finally, your design and implementation. That's all about your work plan, your budgeting, your risk assessments, your procurement procedures, your own standard operating procedures, your safeguarding, child protection, etc. Um, and how will, will you monitor your um, students and staff, by the way? Staff are not immune to this. So we monitor our accompanying uh, staff as well. Uh, both beforehand, during and after, and who's going to do that um, and how you're going to measure the impact, not only on your students, 
but also think about your partner. You know, how there's bound to be an impact on them, on their students, with your students going there. So how can you measure that impact? Because that's all relevant as well. Um, next slide. So I think I just have some feedback from some of our students. Um, over the years, we do pre-surveys and post-surveys and focus groups. Um, and this is some of the feedback um, from some of our students. Normally, it's very, very positive. If they complain about anything, it's usually things which are, you know, you're, yet, you're on a free trip, don't be worrying about it. Um, but certainly in terms of their skills development, their techni technical um, improvements, um, all really, really good stuff. Um, and this is exactly the type of thing that you can put into your final report. Quotes from students, quotes, things that they said to you um, and how good the opportunity has been. I can't stress enough how fantastic this is an opportunity. Our own students, um, many of them would not get an opportunity like this, particularly now that we can send them to Japan, South Africa, the States, anywhere in the world. A really unique opportunity, which is very beneficial. We've had students go on to work in a Michelin star restaurants, to get gold, silver and bronze at the World Skills. Um, and it just gives them a lot of confidence. Even the teachers feedback, they will say when they come back, they're much more cohesive unit. They're more they're more willing to participate in class and just overall a much better vibe. Um, and I think that's me. I don't really I think I've taken up enough time, Kira. Um, but uh, that's my email address. If any of you want to contact me, that, that's no problem. I'm very happy to do that. Thank you very much, Leanne. That was that was fantastic. And I think it's it's great to see both you and Myrtle saying the same things about the benefits of, you know, this opportunities for students and particularly to gain insights outside of their areas, which is what the training scheme was all about. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. Thank and you. hopefully that was really beneficial for everyone. It's really insightful. Thank you. Um, and now on to the the most the most important section. How do you apply? Um so the application for the training scheme did open on the 14th of February. Um, it doesn't close until the 6th of April. So there is a, a longer window this year for applications. Um, it is entirely online. Um, you register via the a link on the training scheme website and then you will have access to the application form for there. Um, Elaine went through the four um, distinct sections as part of the application form. Where I would now refer you to is the application guide. Um, it is on the Train Scheme website as well. We will add it to the chat, but it will take you through each question with hints and tips of how to navigate the application form. Um, one thing just to note is it is one application per school, per organisation. Um, there, there's some guide, there's a lot of guidelines in there. Each section is weighted and scored anything between 20 to 30 points. The application um, does once it once submitted will go through a independent assessment by trained assessors and we partner with the Association of Commonwealth Universities for that. So CAPTA or DFE are not involved in that. That it is all carried out independently um, and then outcomes are announced by the end of the summer. So mobilities or trips can begin from September 2023. Um, so as I said, the, the main call to action on this slide is to really go to the application guide, have a good look through it, see what's expected, what, what you will need for each question in each area. Um, and it will it, it really is your guidance for that. So program guide and then application guide is your your two main call to actions. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, we've just some tips around finding an international partner. So I think Elaine has addressed this, as has Murdo when we addressed it earlier in the presentation. An international partner is required for the scheme. That may sound quite um, daunting, an international partner, but I know lots of you will already have relationships with schools across the world. Um, again, as Elaine mentioned, it could be virtual, it could be an historic relationship, but there are ways that you can um, find a partner if, if that's not possible, um, that you already have one in place. So the host, it must be a non-UK school though, um, and or in the case of British Overseas Territory, um, and it must be an organisation that's either a school or providing vocational or technical education at any level, um, primary right up to secondary. No restrictions on that country as long as you adhere to the official government guidelines. And again, all of this is um, detailed in the programme guide. Um, on to the next slide, and we have a few tips 
if you don't have a host partner or a, a, a school that you already um, are engaged with, um, there, there's also things via local council. So I think we all, you know, there's lots of towns which have international um, twin twin cities or twin towns, etc. Um, your local council may be able to make that introduction or may know some some introductions to make through other programs that are running. Um, it's also our universities. So the University of Ulster and Queen's University, they have lots of um, partnerships internationally. I think the teaching colleges who who will um, send third year pupils or students to do a year's placement in a university abroad. Um, they may be able to put you into in contact with organisations that way. Um, but they also research, look at previous case studies, look at um, what other organisations schools have partnered with and how. Um, and we also have a top tips blog on this on our website as well, which we will share with you afterwards. Um, and again, if we move on to the next slide, there's just some top tips here for a successful application. So we've seen all the enthusiasm from Murdo and from Elaine and some really good tips from Elaine on doing your application and completing it. Um, you know, we're like a we're like a um, rotating book here telling you to read the programme guide, but I can't stress enough how important that document is. It becomes like your your main Bible for the Turing scheme and the application guide as well. They are really, really beneficial to this. Uh, we also obviously have some top tip blogs and we have video case studies and we now have two guides which are specific for schools and for FE, which brings out some of the key information with more detail on the programme guide. Um, again, just know your priorities, study the application guide, study the, the questions um, and, and look what you would need to um, add to those and what criteria is expected, etc. Um, planning ahead. So again, speak to your host organisations as quickly as possible, collaborate with other members of your team and look at what you can realistically deliver within the project objectives. Um, it's also good to like structure that, think about structure your application form so it's clear when these when the assessors are are marking it, make sure that you clearly get across those key criteria that that, that they're looking for, all laid out in the application guide. Um look at what's relevant for each section. Don't put repetitive information in each section. Um, you know, work work smartly as it says there, cross re cross reference rather than copying and pasting. Um, and again, before you submit. Take note of your unique application ID, check through it thoroughly. Um, they can't be resubmitted. And again, there's only one application per um, per organisation. So don't be too hasty and get in, take time and check over it um, for a successful application. And these tips um, have came from our independent assessors. So hopefully they, they are of benefit to you. Um, we, we've touched on the key dates. So the application window opened on the 14th of February. I'm quite conscious it was during half, half term in Northern Ireland, um, but it is open until the 6th of April. So you can go today, you can register and have um, access to the application form if you haven't already done so. Um, and that window is four o'clock on the 6th of April. Um, just to stress, the applications will not be accepted. So just keep that deadline in mind. And then by the end of summer 2023, the applications outcomes will be communicated to sector um, traditionally via email. Um, and from then you will be given guidance on the next steps if you have been successful. And then we are moving on to the next slide. Um, so some resources. So we've, we've talked about these, the programme guide, the application guide and the promotional guide for school schools. Additionally, we have FAQs. Um, if there's no answer to your questions in the program guide or the application guide or FAQs, we do have a dedicated service desk email which you can get um, in touch with. It's on our website and we will also share it with you afterwards. Um, and they aim to respond to you within five working days. Hopefully any information you need will be in the guides already available or the FAQs. There's also some links here to your blogs, which we we think are really beneficial. So more detail around top tips for applying, the benefits for schools applying, um, top tips for finding an international partner, and then also our case studies. Uh, we've got some really good new video case studies. We've got a recording from Bella Houston, who you hear from earlier today. Um, and we have some case studies from Edmonton Village College, who travelled on multiple trips 
um, over the course of 2022. Um, and then also Hyburn Academy, who took students to Morocco. Um, and they really give you details of, um, you know, what they did in those on those trips and, and the benefits of those. So they are really worth finding out a little bit more about that. Um, I think that's the end of our slide, other than next steps. Um, so we split this into three areas, prepare, register and apply. Some of the preparation we've talked about, you know, talk to us, view the supporting um, resources and plan your application. Register and register now. So that's a link to the website. There's a, a link on the homepage to go through to register on the application portal um, and then start your application. So again, the guided application guide will take you right through every step. Um, you can see it for later and continue as you build your application form, but do not submit until you are ready and applications close on the 6th of April. So I hope that has inspired some of you to, if you've not already done so, register and begin looking at the application. Um, not sure if we have any questions in the chat, but we can, we can check and see, or if there's any questions anyone would like to ask, please put in the chat now. We have um, added um, links in the chat to, to the guys we've talked about and some of the case studies, um, if you want to have a look at those, but we will be sending out an email with a recording of this, a copy of the slides and links to all those resources that we have talked about. Um, and Elaine, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, just a quick question. If you registered last year, do you re-register again this year? Yes, you do, yeah. Thank you. Um, and we've a uh, yep. We can say we've a request for a link to the recording, and we will definitely send that to you. Um, thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Happy if someone wants to raise their hand and and ask a question if they don't want to use the chat or whatever everyone is comfortable with. Minutes. Um, <clears throat> someone's typing. I'm just going to type in the service desk email as well. Um, if you had, do have any questions following this. Um. If there's no questions, just want to wish everyone good luck um, and encourage you all to apply. And I hope this was beneficial to you today. Um, if we, ha if you have any questions, please do send them through and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks to Murdo and Elaine um, and Daniel for your contributions today. It was really appreciated. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, bye. bye. bye.